focus on your breath and see how long you can keep the focus there. If you lose focus, well, get back into focus. And don't count the times that you lose focus. Just deal with each time as it comes, one by one by one. The important thing is you don't let yourself get discouraged. The mind has lots of habits that go against the meditation, so it's obvious that those old habits are going to kick in. Even if you've been meditating for quite a long time, you can go through some bad sessions. You learn how, have to learn how to take that in stride. Part of taking it in stride is just having what the Buddha calls conceit. This passage where Ananda is talking to a nun and saying that even though we practice to overcome conceit, we still need conceit as part of the practice. And here it is, basically, the sense that other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. They can do it. Why can't I? That confidence that this is something you can do, that's what sees you through a lot of things. But you have to be careful with conceit. After all, it is something we want to get beyond. And it has its teeth, or John Mahabhu as it calls them, the fangs of ignorance. When you start measuring yourself against other people, who's better, who's worse. And we're not here to practice to be better than anybody else, or worse than anybody else. We're here because we're suffering. There's stress in the mind, there's suffering in the mind, and we're causing it to ourselves. That's the big irony. I mean, there's enough stress and suffering in the world without our additional piling it on. And everything we do should be for the sake of happiness. You'd think that's why we would act to begin with, or speak or think. Yet often the things that we do for the sake of happiness turn around and bite us. This is why when John Swat was talking about ignorance, he would often translate it in the Thai word for stupidity. We're all pretty stupid. We know that the fire is hot and you stick your finger in it and it gets burned, and yet we go sticking our fingers into the fire. We know that red ants bite and we go sticking our finger down in the nest. That's our stupidity. We have to figure out why we do these things. What's the impulse? Unfortunately, we have the ability to see through our own stupidity. That's something you have to have confidence in. This is where the conceit comes in, the good side of the conceit. Remind yourself, I am capable of doing this. I'm capable of figuring these things out. So try to maintain the healthy side of conceit and watch out for the fangs. The fangs where you start comparing yourself to other people. Because no matter how you define what makes somebody better than somebody else, it's always possible to move the goalposts, and your mind is very clever at doing that. So that when the issue of being better than someone else comes up, and you want to measure yourself as better, you suddenly find yourself measuring yourself as worse. The goalposts have changed, and they keep moving around. And there's a part of the mind that likes to sabotage, it, <coughs> sabotage the efforts to practice. So watch out for that. But also keep in mind, we're not here to impress anybody. We're not here to be better or worse than anyone else. As I said, we're here because we're suffering. That makes make it sound grim, but another one of the things that keeps you going in the practice is have a sense of humor about the whole thing. See the irony of the fact that, yes, you want happiness, and yes, you're doing things that cause suffering.
And if you want to keep insisting in spite of all of that, that you're still very clever and intelligent, well, you're setting yourself up for a fall. This is why if you can laugh at your own mistakes and admit your own stupidity with a good-natured laugh, and it's important that it be good-natured, that helps cut through a lot of the discouragement that can come. And it can also cut through a lot of the unhealthy pride that can come along with the practice as well. The people who count their jhanas or the people who count their attainments. As a John Fung would say, they're counting the different ways in which they're stupid. So if you can see that tendency in yourself, laugh it off and get back to business, business which is, okay, where is there the stress? Where is the suffering? We talk about comprehending stress. That's probably one of the most difficult parts of the path. On the one hand, we know there's pain, but then precisely where the pain comes into the mind. We often miss that. It gets blurred. When they define the first noble truth that life is suffering, that's totally useless. And it's totally inaccurate as well. The Buddha said you have to be very precise. Where is the suffering? He lists different things that we suffer from, and then he points out it's basically it all basically comes down to clinging to the aggregates. How do you catch yourself clinging? What are these aggregates? You have to ferret that out. I mean, they're basically the mind and the body, or the movements of the mind and the things coming up in the body as you sense the body from within. And you want to see how you cling. You want to see how you feed off these things. There are the movements of feelings. When you feel things, when you perceive things, when you fabricate things in the mind for certain purposes. You fabricate a thought. It doesn't mean that you're lying about it, simply that you cobble these things together for whatever purpose you have in mind. This is how we get through the day. This is how we get through our lives, by cobbling these things together. These are all activities. And you want to see how am I clinging to them, and how does my clinging cause suffering? That's the big question. It requires that you be very precise. So we say, well, there's a pain in the body. Well, at what point does that pain come into the mind? You're holding on to a perception. And you want to get the mind still enough so you can ferret these things out. They're all right here. They're all happening right here, simply learning how to see these things in these terms. Otherwise, you see things in terms of your narratives. And depending on the mood of the day, the narratives can be really nice or they can turn around and bite you. You want to be the kind of person who can analyze a narrative and take it into other terms, i.e., where it's the feeling, where is the perception, where is the thought construct. Chop up the narrative. And if you can approach all of this from a larger perspective, that helps. You think about the Buddha on the night of his awakening, before he focused in on the present moment. Analyzing the present moment first, he after he got the mind in a state of concentration, he started wondering about the past, his past. And he saw that it stretched way back. Lots of narratives. You think you've got a lot of narratives coming here today. The, the Buddha had aeons of narratives that he could have focused on. But the question he asked, is there an underlying pattern here? Was this true only of him that he had all these many lifetimes, or did it apply to every, anybody else? or everybody else. And what was the pattern that meant that you moved from one lifetime to another? How did that happen? And what caused it to be good in some cases and very bad in others? That's when he turned his mind to thinking about the whole world, all the beings of the cosmos, seeing how they died and were reborn. And it was only then that he saw the larger pattern, it was this karma intentions which were informed by their views. 
you know, seeing the larger pattern and getting this much larger perspective. Seeing that the universe is not going anywhere, in particular, it's just going around and around and around. Now, some people find that depressing, but the Buddha found it liberating. You didn't have to serve somebody else's purpose. We hear about being part of a larger oneness, which means that we have a role that we have to play in that oneness. And there are lots of people who want to tell us what those roles are. And they get upset when you say, well, no, I'd rather work on the problem of my own suffering. They say it's selfish. But you're actually free to do this. And once you've done this, you've set a good example for other people, and you're able to teach them. So it's not selfish, because we all have our sufferings that come from within, and we have to figure out from within how to solve the problem. And if you can do that for yourself, then if you're fortunate, then you can help other people. But even the Buddha couldn't teach everybody. As he said, he taught only those who were teachable, people who saw that they were suffering and that the problem might be coming from within. And that's not everybody. A lot of people won't admit that they're suffering, and others will say, yes, they're suffering, but it's not their fault. So they keep looking outside, outside, trying to change things outside. But often they just make more of a mess of things. If you look at the history of the human race, you have to have a very strong sense of irony. The people try to solve, solve one problem, and then solving that problem, they create a lot of other problems. That's why we keep coming back again and again and again. So seeing this larger perspective then puts everything into perspective, and particularly the narratives that you carry. Because you see, everybody has their narratives, and they're all just wandering around aimlessly. That allows you to chop up your own narratives to see them in terms of these larger patterns. Okay, there's karma. There have been some unfortunate, unskillful actions in the past, but there have been some skillful ones. If there weren't any skillful ones, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be a human being. So you've got some potentials. Where do you use those potentials most wisely? Well, taking apart this problem of why is it that you create suffering for yourself? Because in creating suffering for yourself, it's going to spill out onto other people too. So thinking in these ways helps get you focused in the present moment in the right way. It helps you shred your narratives, and particularly the ones that turn into the fangs of, fangs of conceit. Just keep that one little part of conceit that says, yes, I can do this. Years back when I was staying with the John Fuang, I was his attendant. And I'd always thought that I'd make a pretty good attendant, but it turned out that I was not nearly as good as I thought I'd be, and it was got to be kind of discouraging. And he kept pointing out areas where I was lacking. And then I had to realize, okay, there was nobody else there to help him. So at the very least, there must be some merit in what I was doing, even though I wasn't doing as skillfully as, as could be done. And sort of bit by bit by bit, I got better at it. Our educational system tends to encourage us in areas where we're already talented. And they don't give us the skills we need to develop mastery or at least develop competence in areas where we're not naturally talented. But one of the best ways of developing that kind of competence is to admit, yeah, I'm not very good at this. But I can do better. And so you learn from other people. Other people are doing it better. How do they do it? And again, you're not trying to compare yourself in the sense of just deciding who's better and who's worse. You're saying, who's got some skills that I can develop? Who's got some skills that I can master? And in John Fuang's words, you've got to think like a thief. 
try to take other people's good points and see if you can make them your own. But if you come at this with the attitude, I've got a lot to learn, but I can do it. If you base your pride on the fact that you're always willing to learn from your mistakes, that's the safest kind of pride there is. So learn how to pick up the narratives of your life when they're useful and learn how to shred them when they're not. And that way this quality of conceit actually becomes a help in the practice, and you're able to avoid its fangs.